Jesus that we can stand up, stand secure on right now, right in this moment, God. We know that you are faithful. You are faithful. You never break your promises. And we praise your name right now. We praise your name. And we sing hallelujah.
Jesus, we love you. We love you. 
Sometimes we need open doors. Sometimes we need doors to slam us in the face. Jesus is all you need. He will open the right doors and he'll close the wrong doors. You need healing? That's what he did for us on the cross. He took everything upon his own body so that we could be healed. Jesus, you are all I need. Say it. Jesus, you are all Let them 
slow down. Let them feel you, God. Let them experience you. Let them feel your arms wrapped around them right now. So tight that they know, that they know, that they know that they are being hugged by the one who loves them more than anybody else in this world. Yeah. 
of Pastor Bob's 39th birthday. <laughs> you know, that is a huge milestone. Doesn't mean he's old. It just means that God has taken good care of our pastor for these 60 years. And we have something special that uh, we want to uh, give actually to all of you. And uh, as they get ready to bring that in, we're going to sing happy birthday to Pastor. Here we go. candles on there, we'd have to call the fire department. Okay. <laughs> have a seat. Thank you so much. And I know they're going to cut it and have it available when people leave. They're going to cut it and have it available for you to take home with you. Yes. And uh, thank Pastor Tim. He's the guy that did that. So I can, I can guarantee you it will be good. Won't it? These two girls know for sure what that cooking's like over there. How many of you brought your Bibles with it today? You're going to need it today because I did not do the electronic church today. So you are going to need your Bibles if you brought it with you today. Sword drill, sword drill, sword drill. How many of you remember those days? Remember those? Oh, aren't we glad they're over? Okay. Reminds me too much of my Baptist heritage. It's all right, though. Do me a favor. Open up your Bibles to, we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 9, excuse me. First off, I want to thank... Uh, you for taking care of the church, Pastor Todd and, uh, well, Todd and uh, Johnny. Uh, Pastor Todd's still recuperating. You need to continue to pray for him, pray for him, pray for him, pray for Pastor Johnny. Shake your heads, yes, yes. Can we get you to turn one more, one more? Air conditioner. Uh, and uh, Pastor Tim and Kidder, uh, Kidder, I thought, did a great job. I heard that they did a wonderful job last week. Give them a thank you, even though they're outside. And I, I just always appreciate Pastor Kathy because she is our, 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 our matron mother. And I tell any cute. Now, I'll tell you something about this young man. What's his name? What's his name? Eli. Eli. If you've ever watched him during praise and worship, some of you he puts to shame. He knows all of the words and he sings all of the time. So some of you need to catch up with him. I do want to make a mention, how many, bought, how many got a bulletin? On the back, next Sunday, Jason and DeMarco will be here. How many have ever heard them? Oh, 
How many of you have never heard Jason and DeMarco? Shame on you. Okay. And I'll tell you the reason why. They are an outstanding young gay couple who have a tremendous music ministry and they have a great, great set of voices. They've won all kinds of awards uh, with Logo and uh, they've been on the cover of Advocate Magazine and their story, their life story has been out there for a long time. They've come under a lot of persecution from uh, churches because they don't believe that we can be gay and Christian. Uh, they've come under a lot of persecution from the gay community because they are Christian and they're very outspoken about it. And uh, I, they're going to be with us next Sunday. It was just happened kind of a fluke. They asked me if they could come next Sunday and I said yes. So they will be here next Sunday to sing for us. And uh, do not miss next Sunday. I will tell you, they are wonderful, wonderful. They've got many, many albums out there. You can look them up on uh, YouTube because they've got lots of their stuff out there. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We saw, while, while Mark and I were in Costa Rica this week, we saw lots of things growing down there. Uh, fabulous fruits. I mean, I will tell you, uh, the, the, the vegetables and fruits that we have here are picked before they're ripe. How many of you know that? Yeah. So that they expect them to ripen on the way to our supermarkets. Well, down there, everything is picked ripe. So I will tell you, the pineapple just is Oh, it's so sweet. Now, I guarantee you that if they had not planted for those crops, we wouldn't have gotten to take care of those. We wouldn't have gotten to eat them. One of the things, how many of you saw my Facebook page yesterday, what my kids did for me? If you, need, if you didn't, you need to go back and look. They sent me a great big one of those edible bouquets, all the fruits and stuff, and Mark has eaten all of the chocolate-covered things that there are in there. All by, I had one, he had the rest. But all that, <laughs> it's not like he didn't have any fruit while we were gone, because that's, that's what we had a lot of. But what happens is, if they had not planted for those, we wouldn't have gotten to eat, eat them while we were there. You're going to have to plant the things that you choose to eat from in the future. And this scripture here, we're going to take a look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's start reading here in verse 6. But this I say, and I'm reading from the KJV this morning. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every person, according as they purpose in their heart, so let them give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a what? Sure. Everybody laugh. Ha, 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 ha. You know what? The devil hates that. The devil hates it when you laugh because he doesn't want you to be happy. How many of you know that? He does not want you happy. And I guarantee you, when you laugh as the offering plate goes by, he is mad. And I like to see him mad. I like to stand on his throat and just step on it really good and just watch him just get angry. The fact that, you know what? I know that God's word is true. I know that God's word is true. God is able to make all gifts or grace abound towards you. That you always having all things and that all things may abound to every good work. As is written, he that disperseth abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now that those that, now he that ministers seed to the sower, that's you, he gives you seed to sow, boast ministers bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. What he's saying is that when you give, you not only prepare for yourself, but you prepare for other people as well. How many of you know that there are a lot of people that there's been a lot of things not prepared for? A couple of weeks ago, we took up an offering for my sister who went back yesterday morning, fly back to the Philippines. Our congregation sent along with her $2,000. You need to, you, you deserve that. You sent $2,000 back to kids and boys who have had nothing prepared for them. Nothing. And I want to thank you for that. And that means that we have sown abroad. And you know what? We can expect things to come in from that. Because when we've given, we know that more is coming. Amen? So let's take a moment. Let's thank God. You know, as we give this morning, as we make out our checks and we give our offerings this morning, that we know that as we give, God is preparing 
to give it back to us. Now, I'll tell you something. It's not when you think it's coming. It's when he knows you need it. How many have ever needed it? You know what? I have, and it was there waiting for me. It was like I was walking down the road, and there it was. God provided exactly when I needed it. He is the Jehovah Rapha. Amen? Join hands with somebody this morning. Let's pray, and let's thank the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning that we have knowledge of your word. And Father, we know more than that. We have the heart of that message that you are a giver and that we have been made in your likeness. We're not people that hoard up and stock up and, and depend on the banks and the mortgage holders. Father, we depend on you. So Heavenly Father, we release ourselves this morning from fear, from anxiety, stress, and frustration, and we embrace you who are the spirit of truth and life and wholeness. And Father, you will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly with you. So Father, we embrace your message this morning. And Father, we thank you in advance for supplying all of our needs in accordance with your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. If you're making out a check, raise your hands. Uh, you don't need an offering envelope, but if you're putting cash in the offering, if you'll raise your hands real quick, we'll make sure that you get an offering envelope. I want to kind of bring you up to date with what's going on uh, around the world. I've had several email from Pastor Robert over in Uganda. They send their love to you this morning. They sent me a nice uh, email. They found out, of course, from Facebook that it was my birthday, and he sent me a nice little birthday greeting yesterday. But he is praying for you. That little group of 28 orphans over there are praying for you today. They're praying for you. They've been praying for you before you got up because their services start much earlier than ours do here, time-wise. Uh, there is a group of people in Honduras that are praying for you. There's 13 uh, solid people there in Honduras, in the capital, that are praying for you. We got folks praying for us. And I guarantee you, they are a lot more in need than we are. So continue to think about that. We met a group of people uh, in Costa Rica, they don't have any LGBT churches either. And I had several of them come to me and ask if we would consider starting a church in Costa Rica. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, Ken, I, I, I thought that was a word from the Lord. Uh, and I'll tell you the reason why. Because I believe that when people are hungry, God will feed them. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will supply that. I don't know how he's going to do all of that, but I just know that somehow in the future, we're going to have hands on all of these that have asked. And uh, I'm excited about that. Our children continue to grow and get, grow up. And Jackson over here just continues to get sweeter and sweeter. And so is Jacoby. Just shake your heads like this. Yeah, see, they listen, they listen, they listen. I, and Pastor Stephanie and Jessica, I mean, they do such a great job with our kids. Give them a thank you this morning. We'll let our kiddos slip out real quick. So if you've got kiddos with you, you let them slip out real quick and go with Pastor Stephanie. And uh, Mark and I had a great vacation. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for allowing us to go. Uh, we really needed that. He really needed that. Uh, we needed, uh, I'll tell you, all I did was nothing. <laughs> and he can vouch for that. I did nothing. I, I very rarely moved from my space by the pool. As you can tell, I got a little son. Try not to, but I did get a little. Uh, what I will tell you is that the Lord's given me a series that I'm going to start today called Adventure. And I believe this message today will change your life. It has changed me. Mark has no idea what I'm going to do. He didn't follow me to the closet. No, I didn't go back in the closet. But uh, what he doesn't know, yeah, isn't that good? I will tell you something. I went, how many of you have ever gotten a love letter from your honey? 
Are you willing to read them in public? Well, he doesn't know that I'm going to read some. Now, this is just a fraction of those that, I'm not going to read all these, okay? But this is just a fraction of the ones that he's given me. I just brought some of them. And, yeah. We, we have this thing that uh, when I traveled a lot, he would sneak cards in my suitcase. And he would sneak candles in my suitcase. And I would get somewhere and there would be a candle there. And he would tell me to light it and remember him. What's not to love about that, you know? But I do want to read you some things because it goes with my message today, not these, but the, the, the sentiment behind it. And I'm not going to read all these because I've read them and read them and read them. And I went back in the closet. He was in, he was, he was playing with this new apple. And uh, this has got two, uh, clond uh, what are they, kind of, kind of chair, chairs? Are they? Ad Adirondack chairs up there. And it's by a fishing thing. It's a lake with a, with, <laughs> with a canoe. Okay, anyway. It says, somewhere out there the sun is shining, the water is calm, and the fish are biting. So what are you waiting for? Happy birthday. And this is what he wrote. I know you don't fish. Aren't the Adirondack chairs divine? <laughs> Happy 60th birthday. Oh. Now, I will tell you something. He has this thing for cats. If you know Mark, uh, I got him a cat. And uh, thank you, Jeannie, for caring for Henry while we were gone. Henry is about five pounds lighter. I don't know how much you fed him while we were gone, but he's having a hard time jumping up to the mantle now. <laughs> Carrying a lot more weight that time. Oh, I did, I did. Henry will get into anything, including his own food. Uh, this is, says, Happy Valentine's. These are the reason I'm going to get back to some. It says, to someone who always knows how to make me smile, thank you for the million ways every day you show me and tell me you care. Show you and tell you I care. Now, if I began to take a look at the words that he wrote, on the days that he wrote these, probably, I could begin to find out a lot more about him. But I'm not going to delve into that part today. This is a thank you for your kindness. Everything you love, loves you back. These are words from him. I flourish and bloom, grow and grow in your love. This time is precious. I'm glad we're making the most of it. Glad to see you go. No, sad to see you go this time. <laughs> And feel sad to see my best friend and teammate go. Accomplish great things. Stop to love yourself along the way. I love, he writes things on the outside of cards, so the letter actually begins on the outside. For he who does not crush or constrain, yet patiently, lovingly waits for the heart to open. Robert. Another cat. I have a reason for reading these, reading these. Love you. Have a great trip. Pray for your comfort and traveling mercies. Please pray for me to strategize, crystallize, understand the mastery of computer this week. Every week. I'm leaving plenty of room for God to show up and remember sacrifice the price and not to remember self. I thought that was sweet. And he does need help, every one of you. He bought a new apple before we went. There's no one that wants to talk to us down there that knows anything about apple because he has spent hours questioning them. I miss you like a bird misses singing to herald the daylight. My day is brighter and more complete with you in it. Isn't that sweet? Because of, what you're, because of what you've done, I now believe God's worth living and trusting in all things. You lift me up so I can see heaven. All of the lands I've traveled and places I've been, 
I love home with you the best. Oh, that was written by somebody else. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to read one last one. I'm like Jay Leno. I've got several that I could throw out. But I enjoy sharing and learning what gifts love brings when I'm with you. I'm always learning and am lucky, honored in your patience, waiting for me to arrive where you are. Thank you for renewing my heart and being willing to care. Love, Mark. Now, I'll tell you why I read those. I did not sit around wondering who wrote them. I didn't sit around wondering who wrote those to me. I did not sit around trying to parse out the verbs of the language that he wrote. I didn't try to decipher every little thing about every part of those words. I didn't do that. But what I did hear was the heart of the man God sent me. When you read the Bible, it's not important that you know everything about it because there are going to be some parts of it you will never know. You will never have what the early authors of those letters had, which was the divine inspiration to write them. You'll never have that. What we have, though, is a chronicle of the love and the heart of a father who seeks after his kids with a long suffering that he doesn't want anyone to be away from him. We have the love of a father explained to us from cover to cover how much he loves us. That is the purpose of the most important love letter you could ever read. If it were written to no one but you, it was for you. Because he wanted you to know exactly how much he loves you. What he did for you, how he provided for you, the promises that he gave to you. That's the whole reason this book was written. Not to sit there and decide who is in and who is out. That's not the purpose behind this, because you have to take the overall context of this book with the understanding that God is love. That is the only thing that we can read. That's the only filter that we should be reading this book through. So in this series on adventure, we're going to find out that the Bible is easier to read than live. But I'm telling you, God wants you to live this book. He gave it to you as a guide, as a path, the light of your path. The word is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. David wrote that because he knew God. He knew him in a special way. God wants us to move beyond information what the words are and how we can decipher these. And we can get into an argument as to how this goes from this and how that doesn't explain this and who's in and who's out. We can, we can sit around and talk about knowledge, but you know what? It is not about knowledge. It is about who wrote that book and what his purpose was. His purpose was to remind us how much he loved us. And I guarantee you, there is no one outside that circle no one. Because he didn't have children to say, I love everyone but you. You know, that would be like me telling my kids that out of those four, I love three of them, but not one of them. I can't do that as much as on some days I would like to. I cannot do that because I love them all. God wants us to take this book and he wants us to be 
transformed, not informed. You see, you can study and study and study and you can parse out the verbs and you can get in all of the stuff and you can find yourself deep, diving deep, deep, deep into knowledge and still not know who God is. The Pharisees did that. They spent their whole life studying the law, arguing every time they met about what this meant and about what that meant and who's in and who's out. Who did what right and who did what wrong? And because you did that wrong, you were out of the club. Well, you know what? That's not, that was never the purpose. It was never the purpose. And it wasn't law. It was a guideline. It was a guideline. Let me tell you something. When I read these, all of them, I'm more concerned about what I feel when I read them than what I know about them. I could ask him, what made you write that when you wrote it? What were you feeling? What were you going through? You know, it doesn't really matter because it moved me. I felt it. Well, did I have to decipher every little word? What is he really trying to say? Is there an innuendo here that I'm not getting? Is there something hidden? No, it's right there, plain black and white. I don't have to wonder what he meant. I don't have to go to bed wondering, well, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to think about it. He said he loves me. I wonder what that really means. I don't have to wonder. I know. I never take my love letters that he's written me and I want my kids to read them. I never ask myself, do I want my children to read what he wrote me? Because there's nothing there that I wouldn't want them to read. There's some things there that he wouldn't want them to read. <laughs> but there's nothing there that I wouldn't want them to read. I don't sit there saying, how can I possibly earn his love? What can I do to make him love me more? Can I provide something more for him? Can I do something more for him? I, that is not a part of our relationship. He loves me because he loves me. Not because I do for him, but because he's chosen to love me. I don't have to wonder if he loves me. I never have to analyze his handwriting. What does it look like today? Is he crazy? Always. So I don't have to think about that. <laughs> Is it, the, is, it the, is it the handwriting of a serial killer? Not today. Okay. <laughs> so I can sleep tonight. There are some nights I didn't sleep. <laughs> but the Bible is the greatest love story ever told. Ever told. It shows how to live, how to love. He gives us a model of what our relationship to him should be like. That's the whole thing. But you know what? From cover to cover, it's a story of an unconditional, patient, and gentle lover seeking to win the hearts of the reluctant. Because we think there's something up to what he wants us to do, how we can be, what do we have to do to earn his love? There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Joe, isn't it a good thing that Neil loves you in spite of who you are? Neil says yes. Well, see, I know just enough of Joe that Neil would have to have the patience of God. I know. I understand. The five books that we've talked about before, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are the books of the law. And those books, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, parsed, ripped apart, pulled apart, and they use those as a means of becoming perfect. Well, you know we can't. But they did. They used those things to decide who was in and who was out. Does it sound like the church today? Sure it does. Do they decipher and try to pull apart a few verses to decide who's in and who's out? Or do they look at the one who wrote that and says, I love you. You know, it amazes me that they use a few scriptures out of Leviticus, which right above it says, don't touch anything that's of a pig. But yet they'll watch football every Sunday, those heteros will. <laughs> and a few gays. 
Yes, Kristen, I know you have to watch your football. <laughs> I know. She will miss church not to miss the kickoff. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> they wanted a strict, rigid, black and white interpretation of every word that was written. And they took each word and ripped it apart and how it was put into a sentence because they wanted to know exactly when in reality, back away from it and all you see is this umbrella of love. You see that God loves because everything he's done for us proves it. I am here today because I know that God loves me that I know that he still has a plan for my life because if my plan was up, I wouldn't be here. I am a firm believer that once I do what I'm supposed to do while I'm here, God will say, come on home. So I'm still here because there's still things to do. So I know that. If you take a look in 2 Timothy verse three, chapter 3, I'm going to read it to you. You can write it down later. And go back and read it. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All scripture is God-breathed. I like that. It comes from him. It's his purpose. You know, when you, when you think about trying to live by the law, it was so hard. They made more rules out of rules. And they made more rules out of the rules, out of the rules, out of the rules, out of the rules that they made. You couldn't walk so far away from your home because it would be work. If they were alive today, they would say you cannot turn on a light switch because you're making something work on the Sabbath. You're making something turn. You can't do that. We would live in the darkness. We would live in the cold. We would live in the heat. We wouldn't have food unless we prepared it the day before because you can't prepare food on the Sabbath. Every little thing had another little rule attached to that. How do you wash your hands? How do you walk through a crowd? Oh my God, you touched a Gentile. Oh, you've got to go through the cleansing ceremony. Again, that's twice in the last 10 minutes. All of those things were rules that they created because they wanted to live a perfect life. God never wants perfection. He just wants his kids to love him back. Thank God my kids don't want a perfect dad because they didn't get one. Paul makes this statement. When he was in the Sanhedrin, which is the elite of the elite in the temple, he makes this statement in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. He says, for the legalistic righteousness, for the legalistic righteousness, I was flawless, faultless. He lived a very rigid, structured life, and he lived it flawlessly. You know what? It wasn't until he found out about Jesus that took all the rules off that made his life flourish. Stop living by the law. It was never intended because God's gift is life and the law was designed to kill. It was designed to make them hurt so bad that when Jesus came, they would rejoice. They've been set free, but still people want to live within that confines of that little box. Now, you know, doctrine is good, but unfortunately, some doctrine turns out to be pretty bad. You know, doctrine can lead to spiritual smugness. Everybody know what smugness is? To be smug, kind of puffed up. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 says, They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. They don't know. Does that sound like people today? They'll tell you one thing, but they don't even live by what they tell you. You cannot push in and push, pull out of Scripture things that are not there, that are inconsistent with the fact that God loves us. You can't do that. God doesn't do that. Right doctrine 
breeds a false sense of security. John 5, 39 and 40, it says, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. They thought that their whole life was going to be revealed in the knowledge that they got. It's, you know, there's about 12 to 15 inches between heaven and hell. Head knowledge won't get you anywhere, but heart knowledge will get you to heaven. You cannot study and study and study and study and become righteous. Paul's making that statement really clear. What you can do, though, is that you can wrap your mind around a heavenly father that doesn't ask anything of you, but allow him to take care of you. Who wouldn't love that? I mean, we're talking about the daddy of daddies. Sugar daddy, sugar daddy, sugar daddy. Who wouldn't want that? My kid's still trying to get that. Pharisees, both past and present, mistakenly believe that the law requires only right doctrine and obedience to that. To correct that kind of thinking, we're going to have to look at something. I want you to take a look, and this is where we're going to get into the scripture here. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. This is a group of parables. How many of you know what a parable is? A parable is a story that contrasts something that's true. It's something that compares and contrasts something that's real, something that's true. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables because he didn't want everybody to understand. The problem with it was they didn't get it either. They didn't get it. Now, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. This is Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read quite a bit but I, because there's several different parables all here. He's trying to get a message across. But we're going to take a look at the first one. This is the parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered about him, and he was in the boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on shore. When he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, uh, it didn't happen. Verse 6, But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. <laughs> the disciples began to ask him, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom, everybody say secrets of the kingdom, of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even that which they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Because Isaiah said that he will come and speak in parables. So Jesus had to speak in parables to fulfill prophecy. All he's doing is walking out his course of life. He says, you will be, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceive. Now, I'll tell you something. This parable is really interesting in the fact that we've, how many have ever heard a story about the parable of the sower? We all have. The word, the word, and Jesus are synonymous. Kathy, what scripture is that? John what? John 1, 1. Jesus is the Word. Everybody say it. Jesus is the Word. So Jesus equals the Word. Now we have a nickname for the Bible and we call it the Word. But the Word consists of two parts. The written Word and the living Word. Okay, you with me? Jesus is that Word that was sown. Jesus was that Word that was sown out there to all those people. Now, it's interesting, I've seen a little seed that falls into a crack of a rock. And that little seed has so much potential and power in that seed that it will force its roots down into that crevice and it will literally break open 
that rock. How many have seen something like that before? That's because that seed is powerful. It is power filled. In the word of God, Jesus Christ, when he came, he knew that when he was given to some people, they would never get it. Never get it. He knew that on some people, the cares of this world would be more important than he would be. The things of, you know, like when the rich young ruler came to him, the rich young ruler said, I can't go with you because I've got all these things I've got to take care of. There were people that he talked about that said, oh, I can't go with you because my father's died and I've got to go and bury him. I've got to go and do this. I've got to take care of this. I've got to take care of the family. I've got this oxen over here. I got... He said that the things of the world would choke out who he was. People would be thinking more about those things than they would be thinking about him. And it also gets down there and says, you know what? That he would be planted and then some would come up 100, 60, and 30 fold. You know what? It's not about the seed, folks. It's not about the quality of the seed because we know that Jesus is the seed, the incorruptible seed, the Word of God. Nothing is more powerful than that. But we do know that the difference is the soil. Now, I think it's interesting that when he was planted amongst those, it did produce a harvest. You know what? Not all disciples are cookie cutters. Not all of you are going to be exactly like the next person. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad there's not two of me when you look at Mark? I am. Because God only knows what I would be if I, if I looked like him all the time. That pointy little hair he does. I can't get by with that. He's younger. You will be 60 one day. And I'll be around to wish you a happy birthday. I might be in a roller, but I'll be there. I remember when my daughter, my oldest daughter said, Dad, you are really old. I turned 35. She was several years younger, but she was born in 76. Six years later, I was 82. So in 1982, when I had my birthday, she said, Dad, 35 is really old. So when she turned 35, I called her and said, you are really old. <laughs> really old now. She's going to be 36 this year, and I would say, that's ancient. <laughs> Older than dirt. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about knowledge, but knowledge doesn't supersede an understanding of who that is. Why did there have to be so many different kinds of harvest in that hundred 60 and 30 fold because some people latch hold of something and they run with it until there's no stopping them. There are other people that, I mean, they still produce and that's a good thing. And there'll be people that, that grab hold of who God is and they'll still produce a harvest in their life. But not everybody's going to have that top cream of the crop because every soil is different. Mark and I went to the theater yesterday, watch a movie and right next to that theater, they had a great big field that they just turned over and I said, doesn't that look like rich dirt out there? It's really dark. They've put good things in there before we've seen them grow and we just watched it just grow up. You are good soil. You are good soil. And the thing you need to remember is what God plants in you, it is going to come up. But you have to remind yourself of who God is. He is the God that loves you. He is the God that cares for you. He is the God that sent his son to die for you. This is an overwhelming understanding that God is so big in his love, I can't wrap my mind around it. Let's read on. Because we're going to read down to 23. We're not going to finish this today. In them the word of, okay, we've read that, 15. For his people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and, what they, and, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ear, eyes and hear with their ears and understand in their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see. Everybody say, my eyes are blessed. Eyes are blessed. And your ears are blessed. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people 
longed to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, everybody say the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is unlike this one. There is no judgment going on in heaven. There is no sickness going on in heaven. There are no banks in heaven. There are no mortgage holders in heaven. There are no people who are running around condemning others because of what they believe. There's nothing like that. The kingdom of heaven is already here. You just have to be a part of it. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. See, people can hear about how much love God has for them, but they can turn around and judge somebody else. They can preach that God is love. That's what the scripture says. And they can turn and condemn somebody else. See, that's inconsistent. That's not the word of God. That doesn't wrap with what God has to say. So when you hear that, go, mm, that's not God. Because we need to have ears that hear what God's saying. We need to have eyes to see what he's saying. The seed, okay, when it snatches along the seed, their heart. The seed is sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to those that hear the word, but the worries of this world and the deceitfulness as a will cloak the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. Here's the word. Here's Jesus. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You need to remind yourself what he came and said. He said, I have come with healing in my wings for you. I've come to deliver the captive. I've come to open the prison doors. I've come to make the deaf to hear, the blind to see, and the lame to walk. That's what I've come for. That's what Jesus said. That's what you need to remind yourself. What did Jesus really do for me? He did a whole lot for you. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160, 30 times what was sown. Now, when we saw those plants planted over there in Costa Rica, New things happening all the time. We, we saw avocados on trees of all different sizes and shapes because they were all in a continuous form of growing. There was not a time when they stopped growing and harvested, nor did they flower and start again because on the same tree you could see all different stages because it was constantly producing. The Bible says that when that seed is sown in our hearts, we should produce. Well, what should we produce? Love. Joy, peace, what else? Patience, long-suffering, what? Goodness, kindness, temperance. Okay, so it doesn't say that when the Word of God is sown in you, you should produce hate, judgment, condemnation, arguing, anger, resentment, bitterness, pain, or pride. None of those things are fruit of the Spirit. So when the word of God has been sown into someone's heart and that's the harvest that they're getting, it's not the God kind of seed that's been sown in their heart because that's not who God is or who he reproduces in your life. So the adventure that we have with God is the fact that, you know what? I want the God kind of life in me. That means that I've got to stop certain activities, bitterness, anger, resentment. And I've got to become more like the word of God that's sown in me who says, I'm come that I might have life and have that life more abundant. You know, we have to have a course correction. The Pharisees had one. We have to have one. In verses 20 through, 21 through 26, Jesus addresses the root of murder, which are hate and anger. 
It goes on in verses 27 through 30. He's concerned with the heart motives because he's talking about adultery. Why do people leave one and seek another? He talks about in the kingdom, God's blessings rest on the merciful. So if I want the blessings of God, I've got to learn to be merciful. That's 38 through 48. And there's some questions I want you to think about. Am I using my biblical knowledge to point out the sins of others? Am I using my biblical knowledge to point out the sins of others? Is that the fruit of the word? No, that's the fruit of the Pharisees. That's what they did with that. Isn't that right, Shaw? They took the word and they used it to condemn. That was never God's intent. So are there evidences that my biblical knowledge has left me puffed up? Am I prideful about what I have? The knowledge that I have. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds. Pride is always on the list of the things God hates. Am I aware of the underlying, underlying motive of my sin? Am I, uh, am I aware of why I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing? Do I have a teachable spirit? Is there room for God to correct the inevitability and the heresy in my own life? Is there room for God? To, am I, can I still say that I'm teachable? You know what I've learned, Shaw, is I've learned that I am never too big to learn. The thing I have learned in my life is that when I was 19 and I went away to school, I thought my dad was the dumbest person I'd ever met. I did. Because I thought, man, I could do so many things so much better than my dad. When I came back from my first year away from school, I wondered where my dad got that crash course on intelligence. Because I came back and he was suddenly the smartest man I had ever met. And I wondered what happened. I got a reasonable understanding that I really didn't know anything. When my daughter came from med school, she was doing her internship with a doctor over, in, over across from Presbyterian Hospital. She went in that, that, that school that day into that hospital in that uh, doctor's office, and she sat at a table. She was going over all of the patient's care, and she came out and she said, you know, I thought I knew something, but I know nothing now. She was sitting amongst about five Nobel Prize winners. And she said, you know, I thought I knew something, but she said, I realize I don't know anything. I'm just learning. So can you say to yourself, I'm still learning what God has for me? Or do I know what it says? Do I have a teachable spirit? All of us are missing the point at some point. Every one of us, including myself. I want to read you something. I think this is wonderful. This is from an 18th century theologian by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He once wrote, there is a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having the sense of its sweetness. Just as there is a difference between having opinion that God is holy and gracious and having the sense of the loveliness and beauty that that holiness and grace bring. So you can tell me the honey's sweet, but until I taste it myself, I really don't know. So when you think about how wonderful and marvelous God is, you can talk about it, and you can study about it, and you can parse those scriptures out, but until you have a sense of how big he is and how much he loves you, you really don't know. These next few weeks, we're going to open up and we're going to find out how big God really is and how much he really does love us. Today is Communion Sunday. I want to remind you about how much he loves you. As Pastor uh, Kidder and uh, Tim prepare for communion, I want to remind you how much God loves you. And my question to you is today, have you read this love letter recently? Have you gone back over it to remind yourself how much he loves you? I don't know if Mark knows that I kept all those. 
but I go back and reread them because it reminds me what he cares and how much he cares for me. Shaw, would you come down and Pastor Kathy, would you come on this side and minister communion today? I tell you, my life has been changed by those few notes that Mark wrote me. Constantly. And if that which is of man can make a difference in my life, and that man make a difference in my life, how much can this book and the man that wrote it to you make a difference in your own life? Heavenly Father, as we come before your table today, Father, we're reminded about how much you love us. Father, we're reminded that you gave your whole life for us. You loved us so much. So, Heavenly Father, as we take of the bread and we dip it in the cup today, Father, we're reminded that we're going to spend eternity in heaven with someone who's died to make that a possibility. Father God, we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everyone here said, Amen and Amen. You divided these stairs.